الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم and السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ما شاء الله that's that's a pretty enthusiastic salam for a Friday night right ما شاء الله ما شاء الله may Allah سبحانه وتعالى reward you all hugely for for coming on this very um, rainy evening سبحان الله it's very English tonight isn't it the weather الحمد لله so I wanted, inshallah ta'ala, to, uh, to speak today about some parts of the seerah and, and talk about some really beautiful things that happened at the time of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And I want us to be able to use these things to reflect on are we actually following Islam in its entirety or are we just follow, following certain sections of Islam. And I'm going to tell you what I mean when I say that. I find that nowadays, and alhamdulillah, I've been Muslim for 26 years now, and I find that nowadays um, we, we seem to be reducing Islam into one element, which is the rules and the regulations and the hukum, the rulings in Islam. So it seems and feels sometimes like we have almost lost the spirit and the heart of Islam because we're so interested in becoming the haram police, as I call them, and we're so interested in trying to just follow these rules and regulations that we've almost lost the emotion that is behind them, which actually is also a massive part of the sunnah of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what the objective today for this uh, for this uh, lecture is, inshallah ta'ala, is to, to try and search, not for the rulings, because alhamdulillah, we know the rulings, we know the halals and the harams and all the rest of it. We, we need to look for the spirit of Islam, so that when we are implementing those rulings, this hukum of Allah, we are doing it with hikmah, with, uh, with wisdom. SubhanAllah. So, but at first, actually to understand the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we must first understand what it is. So, we've got the hukum that we've talked about. So, so, so this is the, the ijtihad, the qiyas, the laws, the regulation, which are based on um, either uh, um, interpretations of the Quran and the sunnah or things that are very set in stone. I'm not going to talk about sharia today. This is something that um, is a different lecture. And then we have the spiritual side of Islam, the spirituality, and then, of course, we have our akhlaq, our adab. And all these are in some way gelled together, but are also separate elements on their own as well. So if we were to draw a diagram of Islam, Islam would be in the centre of everything, but then we would have our personal issues, our societal issues, our family issues, but then these two would be divided into two areas. So the first area that we see is the, the laws and the actions of spirituality. So these are the laws in actual fact that are not uh, uh, covered by the hukum of the dunya, by the sharia, which is of course is the hukum of the dunya. These are laws and spirits and regulation that is judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. And we are told in the Quran that these are the, th the punishments that we will get or the rewards that we will get for following or not following certain laws and, laws and rules and regulations. However, we notice that for these particular laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set, which are spiritual laws, there's actually no hukum, no ruling on fin in, uh, in the dunya, in, the, in this life, uh, uh, or no punishment for those. And this is a very interesting point to make. Why? Because these are the laws of the heart. Am I not um, coming through very loudly? Surprising for me. Can you hear this? I don't think this is on. The red one? Now it's on. Okay. I'm going to have to put it back down now because I'm going to be too loud. <laughs> okay. Jazakallah. Not a very technical person, I'm afraid. So, um, so what we see, can someone turn the echo off because it's really irritating? So what we see is that um, the, the spiritual side of Islam is something that is judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's actually the, 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 the rulings that we implement on ourselves. And, and they are al they're part of the unseen because no person on earth can see inside somebody else's heart. 
No person on earth can see, for example, if you got up for Fajr this morning, or you, or you prayed your Qiyam al last night, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. So there can't be any punishment or ruling or hukum in, in the dunya for this, because it's something that is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think very often in modern society, we, we have this trend of almost judging people based on something that actually should be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is this, this, where we're looking at the spirituality side of Islam. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent as rahmatan lil alameen. He was sent as a mercy for all of them, all of the world. And the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also describes himself as a mercy and as a guide. So the first question that we have to be asking ourselves is, am I emulating this mercy and this behavior and this akhlaq and this adab in all the different areas of my life or am I simply following the rules and regulations of Islam? And we need to think about why that is. So character is something that affects absolutely every part of our lives. It affects the people around us. It affects our families, our friends, our brothers and sisters, the, the non-Muslims around us. It affects everybody who our lives touch. And having a good character softens our hearts. And so what we're going to do, inshallah ta'ala, is to take a few steps through the journey of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And actually, Ibn, Ibn Rajab al hanbali may Allah be pleased with him, summarized the behavior of the Rasulullah into five different points. Number one, they were fulfilling other people's rights. Number two, avoiding darar. Darar is one of the, um, one of the major areas of the Sharia, which is the, the word harm in English. So avoiding doing harm on other people. Number three, having a positive attitude and a positive outlook. Number four, recognizing and responding to other people's goodness with goodness. And the fifth one is returning negative with positive. So even if somebody does something negative to us, as Muslims, we should be returning this with something good, something positive. So the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always recognized the other side and he always acted accordingly and made it easy for people. In fact, there is a story that's related by Anas bin Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, and it's actually in the book of Bukhari. And it's related that a man on a camel came to the mosque and the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba anhum, were there and he said, this man said, and the, this man is he's, he's a, you know, he's a strong looking guy and, and a very strong looking camel and he says, <laughs> which of you is Muhammad? And the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I am here to answer your questions. And the man said, I want to ask you something. However, I'm going to be really harsh in the way I ask you. So don't get angry. And the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, instead of like some of us would who put in conditions, he didn't. He said, ask as you like. So the man asks about several things. It's quite a long hadith. I'm not going to go through the whole hadith. This is just taking some bits from the hadith. And the man asks, is Muhammad the, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He also asked, has Allah asked you to pray five times a day? So he asked about the salah. And he asked about the fasts in the month of Ramadan, and he asked about the paying of zakat from the rich to the poor. When the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had answered all his questions, the man said, I believe in all you've been sent with. I was sent by my people as a messenger. I am Dimam bin Thalaba from Bani Sa'ad bin Bakr tribe. So he was a representative. And the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't know this at the time. This is just a man coming to ask about Islam. He didn't know this at the time, yet because of the answers that he gave with knowledge and wisdom, this man goes back to his tribe with such a positive face of Islam. SubhanAllah. How many of us are giving this positive face to Islam to our work colleagues, for example, when we're walking down the street, when we're getting on a bus, whatever, when we're parking the car or whatever? We all know the very famous story of the man who was urinating in the mosque of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We all know this story. I'm not going to reiterate it in its fullest because it's a very popular story. 
And the companions actually became very angry when they saw this man urinating in the corner of the masjid. But the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what? Well, he said, leave him. And there are actually different narrations of this hadith that says, they say slightly different things. But the general message is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stopped the Sahaba from uh, being angry with this guy and from possibly even throwing him out from the masjid. And he said, wash the place. So we've got a lot of different lessons here. We've got a lesson of how to deal with somebody who clearly does not have the, the ilm, the, the knowledge and the, uh, the, the hikmah, the wisdom to not know, not to, not to go and urinate in a mosque. I mean, can you imagine nowadays if somebody, somebody, maybe a non-Muslim person came into possibly Muslim welfare house, yeah, Ali, <laughs> if someone comes into your masjid and starts doing their thing in the corner, huh? what are the brothers going to do? They're going to get angry and they're going to go into subhanAllah because it's this, it's, this, it's this immediate response. When you put it into this context and you see this in your mind's eye, it's like, whoa. But this is what happened at the time of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi You're not going to tell me that happened once, right? Yes. Oh boy, subhanAllah. And what happened? I actually shouted at the person, but then I stopped because I remembered the You remembered the hadith, hadith. mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mashallah, may Allah, may Allah uh, reward you hugely, <laughs> subhanAllah. But you, but you asked him to leave, huh? <laughs> subhanAllah. So, the Bedouin afterwards, when he, in one of the reports, the Bedouin afterwards actually said about the incident that the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't curse, scold, get angry or hit me. So he was maybe expecting these things to happen when he did this action, because it was an action that he probably had a, a, a bit of a feeling that it wasn't good. But the Rasulullah answered in such a beautiful way. And not only this, we get the fiqh of tahara, of cleaning a place where we want to pray. So we get so, so, much, so much wisdom and so much knowledge from these hadiths that we forget about, but we must be able to apply them in our own lives as well, inshallah. The Rasulullah was always kind and generous in all circumstances. And actually, there was, um, there, there was a, a man, and this is in the Battle of Badr, and there was a man called Abu, Az, Abu Aziz, and I don't know if you guys have heard of him, a man called Abu Aziz, and he was fighting the Muslims in Badr, and he was actually a very important person in the army. He was the guy who holds the banner. So he holds the sign. If, the, if, if anyone knows anything about battle, and this is, this is actually still uh, the case even in the First and Second World War, the, the one who holds the banner, one, when the banner is up, we know that, the, that this side is safe and that the leader is well. If the banner or the, the banner holder goes down and this person is killed, then the, they, the, the army, they start losing hope and they start thinking maybe we lost. So it's always a target for the enemy, the, the banner bearer, that they always want to go for this guy. And so he was actually taken captive by the Muslims. So this is somebody who was act actively fighting against the Muslims and he's taken captive. And he, the, what would happen was when, they, when the uh, prisoners of war were taken, they were given to different tribes to look after. So, they would be, so this, this man actually was given to a group of the Ansar, Rabbiullah Anhum. And actually, of course, he's expecting that he's not going to be treated too great, right? Because generally, prisoners of war don't expect to be treated very well. This is a member of the enemy they've been fighting against. SubhanAllah. He reported, when the Ansar laid out their lunch and their dinner, they would give him the bread with the dates, while they had just the dates on its own, without bread. And the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had ordered this. He had ordered the Sahaba to treat the prisoners of war in such a beautiful way. And actually, Abu Aziz felt very embarrassed and tried to give the bread back to the Ansar. But they refused and they would not take it back. And this is actually um, one of the stories that Ibn Hisham relates in, in, in his version of the seerah. I'm going to give you a scenario now, okay, and I want you to really think about this, because this is something that doesn't happen very often. You've got a friend, okay, you've got a friend who's generally a good person, someone who prays five times a day, somebody who's you know, a pretty good Muslim, but they keep constantly committing one particular sin, okay? This person is an alcoholic, 
or a drug addict. So they're a practicing Muslim, but they're an alcoholic or a drug addict. And they keep behaving kind of inappropriately. All right? What are you going to do with this person? What are you going to do with this person? How is your relationship with this person going to be? Are you going to stay friends or brothers with this person? Or are you going to move away from this person? You're going to take them out? Or maybe you are going to do takfir on this person. Maybe you're going to say to this person, Khalas, you care for now. Because believe me, brothers and sisters, this is something that happens very regularly in our societies. As soon as we hear that somebody is committing a major sin and they're doing it regularly, in fact, even if we get an indicator that somebody is doing a, a, a major sin, we immediately we start being negative and nasty to them. And we start saying to them, oh, you, you did this, this cuff and your fasak. And you, we give them all this negativity. So what are you going to do? Give me some answers. What are you going to do? How are you going to treat this person? Are you going to take them as your best friend? Be truthful. You, are you going to talk to them? Are you going to take them as your best friend, your closest friend? You could? Okay. Unsure, but move, might move away. Put your hand up if you'd move away. Be honest. You've got to be honest. This is this is Allah's house. The brothers are just like, I don't want to answer this. Hadith Prophet said, Umtu Afat Abalim and Allah Dhumma. Yeah, but this is somebody who's facet. This is somebody who's doing something regularly, very major sin. What are you going to do with this person? We live in a, an age now where takfir is a very normal thing. We use the word kafir like it's water coming out of our mouth, subhanAllah. Does it mean that somebody has got this struggle or test that we're going to judge them? Does it make them out of Islam? Does it make them a bad Muslim? Now, subhanAllah, this was also the case at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I'm going to tell you about an amazing guy. And do you know something, subhanAllah, we, we, we view the Sahaba as being these sort of almost saint-like individuals. But actually, subhanAllah, they were human beings like me and you. And they struggled and they had their problems and their issues as well, subhanAllah. And we forget that they were like this. Now, this amazing Sahaba, may Allah be pleased with him, was called, was called Naiman bin Amr bin, bin, uh, bin Amr al-Ansari, radiallahu anhu. And he was um, one of the very early Medinan Muslims. And he was a very prominent Sahabi. In fact, we, we expect somebody like this to, he's, he's very close to the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was somebody who used to travel. He took, participated in the battles. He participated in the treaties. This is somebody who's a close Sahabi. And his test was alcohol, just like we've been talking about. In fact, he really struggled with alcohol. To the extent that he kept on getting drunk and then he, he came and he kept and, and he was flogged twice for being drunk subhanallah in fact umar radiallahu anhu we know umar right he's he's, he's an asad he's, he's, an, he's an angry guy guy subhanallah and umar actually said about uh, nuaiman may allah's curse be on him because he was so frustrated with his actions but the rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam heard umar and he said to him, no, no, you, you don't do this. You don't say like this. Indeed, he loves Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This Sahabi was not pushed out because of the regular sin that he was making. He was not ostracized. He was not judged. The Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam understood his tr struggles, but he also understood that this is a genuine Sahabi that loves Allah and loves the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm going to ask you a question now, brothers and sisters, and I don't want you to answer this, I want you to think about this. How many recovering alcoholics and drug addicts, Muslim, have you helped and have you supported in your time as a practicing Muslim? How many people who are alcoholics have you brought to the masjid with you to help them? How many drug addicts? We, we have a lot of drug addicts in our communities. Is that? It's right. We do. But how many of us are bringing them to the masjid? How many of us are spending our time with them and supporting them and helping them with their Islam? 
don't answer this. This is, this is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's something that we really need to think about. Now, Nu'ayman was a prankster. And he used to do the most hilarious, prank, hilarious pranks. Do you want to hear about one of his pranks? Yes or yes? Do you want to hear about yes. one of his pranks? Yes, I'm not hearing this. Yes, yes. So it's not just, I can just bypass them. There's only one person. I'm going to tell her afterwards. Yes, yes. Please. Inshallah. Okay. There was a time when Nu'ayman, Abu Bakr and uh, Sawaybit went tra on a trade trip to, Bas uh, to Basra. And they each were given, and this is something, a very important lesson for when we go on trips and we're spending time together, they were each given a particular responsibility. And actually, Suwaybid was responsible for the food on the trip. So it's his responsibility to distribute the food. But of course, Abu Bakr, is the emir. He is the leader of the trip. Okay, so he's the in charge. So Nu'ayman was asking... Uh, so wait a bit for some food. He says, he says, I'm hungry, man. I want to have some food. Can, I, can you give me some food? Because he's in charge of the food. So so wait a bit said to him, no, not until Abu Bakr comes and gives his permission that I can give you some food. How is this for allegiance to the Emir of a group that he will actually make somebody wait for food? So Naaman, he's a bit upset. He's a bit annoyed with his brother. So what he does, he sees a group of people. And he goes to these people, he goes to these guys, this tribe, who were passing through. And he said to them, I've got a slave. He's amazing. He's Arab. He's articulate. He's very good with his words. He's strong. But if you go and take him, if I sell him to you and you go and take him, he is going to resist you and he is going to claim that he's a free man. Do you want him? Do you want to buy him? Do you want to buy this guy? This is not Amen, one of the Sahaba. So anyway, a bit of bartering goes on and they agree on te 10 dirhams to sell uh, Suwaybit. So of course the guys they they they, they give uh, they give Noaiman the money and then they go over to Suwaybit and he resists. He's like, I'm a hur, I'm a hur, I'm free, I'm a free man. Yeah, your master said you'd say that. Come with us. So they bundle him into the camel train. This is one of the big Sahabi. They bundle him into the camel train. They take him, capture him, and take him as a slave. And what does uh, Noaman do? He sits there and he's watching all this happening. This is his revenge. He wants to get his own back. So when Abu Bakr comes back, he sees the Sahaba together and, and he says, where's Suwaybid gone? And then, of course, it all comes out what's happened and that he's played this, track, this prank on Suwaybid. So they have to chase after this tribe, they have to chase after this caravan, do another negotiation, pay to get the brother back. Um Salama radiallahu anha related, and this is it's her who actually relates this hadith, but she related that the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba laughed about this incident for a full year afterwards. He sold, he, he sold to slavery one of the main companions of the Rasulullah to get his own back because he was hungry and wanted food and was refused. And this was the type of thing that Naiman would do. But the Rasulullah and the Sahaba, they loved his sense of humour and they loved the pranks that he played. You know, very often as Muslims, we have this kind of straight, you're not allowed to smile, it's just, just haram to smile, haram to have fun. Subhanallah, we lost this, this spirit of Islam here. We have to remember that the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, they, they used to have a laugh and they used to have some fun together. And we need to find this back because when people see us walking around and we're miserable faces, they're going to think Islam's miserable as well, subhanallah. Even in leadership, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed rahmah, mercy and hikmah. I'm going to tell you about an event, a very nice event, 
And, and I'm sure you guys have heard about this event, but I want to reiterate this because it's a very important event. And it's the, the event that happened in Hudaybiyah. And this was actually the time, or just, at the, it, just after this, the Surah Surah Al-Fat was uh, revealed to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'm just going to summarize this for you because we don't have a huge amount of time. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a dream. And he dreamt that, and remember, this is the time when the Sahaba are not allowed into Mecca. There's a lot of problems going on between the Quraysh and, and the Muslims, and they're all in Medina at this time. And so he had this dream that he went to Mecca and did Umrah. And he told the Sahaba, anhum, and they got so happy because they were desperate. Imagine that you are taken out from your hometown. And you're not allowed to go back into your hometown because there are opposing forces, but you've still got family there, you've got all your memories there, that's your life there. This was the situation. And remember, there were no Muslims in Mecca at this time because of the, hosti the hostilities. So what does the Rasulullah do? He, he acts very clever. He starts inviting the tribes of Medina, the Muslims and of course the non-Muslim tribes as well, and invites them to travel down to Mecca. Okay, what's the wisdom in this? He gets 1,400 people together. But if he's taking Muslims and non-Muslims with him, then the Quraysh are, number one, going to see a lot more people that are supporting the Rasulullah and the Muslims. But they're also going to see that the, the Islam is with everybody. That everybody is almost taking the Rasulullah as a leader because of these qualities that he had. And the Sahaba, this is very important, they travelled without any arms, without any swords, without any shields. But the Quraysh tried to make some problems. The Quraysh tried to make some problems. So the Rasulullah ends up trying and having to divert up a much tougher path to get into Mecca, to approach to Mecca. And he reaches a valley and the Rasulullah tells the Sahaba, say, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayk. And subhanAllah, the camel of the Rasulullah stopped in Hudaybiyah and refused to move any further. It wasn't upset, the camel. It wasn't being angry or, or naughty or misbehave. It just stopped and refused to move. And actually, subhanAllah, we know that this camel stopped and refused to move at the same place as the fear, the elephant, refused to move at the time when the, uh, if, you, if, if you know Ashab al the, pe the people of the elephant, it's exactly the same place. SubhanAllah, what a sign is this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the Rasulullah orders the Sahaba, you set up camp here. But there was no water. This is a dry area. If any of you have ever been to Mecca, you'll know that it, it's incredibly dry and some rocky terrain, very rough terrain. It's not like, you know, you think of desert and you think of pretty sand dunes and all this. Mecca is not like this. It's very rough and mountainous. And even the rocks, they look volcanic rocks. So even the rocks, they're very rough. So, the, so Rasulullah وسلم, ordered one of the Quraysh to take an arrow and dig, and subhanAllah, the Quraysh, well, sorry, one of the Sahaba to, to dig with an arrow. And actually some water started coming out from where they dug with the arrow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is one of the one of the beautiful miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks after the Rasulullah وسلم, and the Muslims that when they need something. It, it's there for them. And look at the du'a that they made before this actually happened. What a beautiful thing. How many of us will put ourselves in this position where we need to and make a du'a and then rely on the du'a and have uh, tawakkul in Allah and rely on Allah for the outcome that he's going to... I'm going to tell you a story actually. One of my friends, subhanAllah, one of my friends, this happened to you know it was raining really a lot uh, yesterday. One of my friends, she was out in her car and um, she didn't have any cash on her, she didn't have any money. Her phone was dead and she, her car broke down in a very isolated spot. This happened like just yesterday or the day before, she just told me about this. And um, subhanAllah, 
she sat there and she's actually one of my students and, and a couple of weeks ago we were, we were having a halakha and we were talking about the, the du'a of uh, Ibrahim السلام, we, where he says Hasbi Allahu wa na'mal wakil Subhanallah, she remembered this du'a at the time when she literally, she has nothing so she sat there and she said Hasbi Allahu wa na'mal wakil a few minutes later and she just sat there, she's like okay it's up to you, Allah, now. A few minutes later, a police car pulls up beside her and the policeman gets out and says to her, what, like, are you okay? And she said, well, my, my car's broken down and I can't, you know, I can't call anybody and I have no money to go and uh, get help. And so he said, I'll give you a lift home. I'll give you a ride home. The, the police don't do that. They're not meant to do that. But he saw her lone woman. He says, Get in the car, you can come home, I'll, you know, we'll give you a ride home. She gets into the car, and as the car is setting off, another car comes along. Guess who's in this other car? Her sister, who doesn't even live in the area. Something, subhanAllah, had told her sister, come, my sister needs help. SubhanAllah. Hasbi Allah wa na'mal wakeel. Really, rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, I've transgressed off the subject. I do apologize. So what happens? The camel has stopped in Hudaybi and refused to move in the same place as Al-Fil, the, the elephant. They've now got water. So the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and a lot more things happen. And please look up this story in the tafsir of the Quran, tafsir of Surah, Surah Al-Fat, because it's a very beautiful tafsir. So, and I'm just giving you a small amount of it. But he sent Uthman ibn Affan to talk to the Quraysh. Why? Why did he send him? Why didn't he send, send Umar or one of the strong guys? You know, the one who was very sort of tough. Because his skill was eloquence. Look at this wisdom of Rasulullah. You need to, if you're going to send somebody to cook a dinner, you're not going to send somebody who's not a chef. You're going to send the right person with the right skills. You must remember this. Very often we stick to the same small group of people and we try and push the round peg through the square hole. We try to make people do things that actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given them this particular skill. So we must be very wise in what we're doing. So Uthman goes to the Quraysh and he talks to them, but they capture him. And then later on, some other things happen, some rumours are happening and there's almost a, a battle between them. But actually later on, Suhail ibn Amr is sent by the Quraysh to agree a treaty between the Quraysh and the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has already said, if a treaty is an option, I'm going to take this option. They had 1400 people. They had more than enough people to fight and get into Mecca in that way. But, but Rasulullah saw the bigger picture, and this is very important. Sometimes we want instant results in the actions that we take, but we fail to look at the wisdom of actually sometimes just being patient and waiting is a lot better, and the out outcome will be a lot better. So Ali uh, was ended up as the scribe of this treaty. And I think we know the story that um, he wrote Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim at the top of the treaty and the Quraysh, no, no, you can't, we want you to write something else. And um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, leave it. In fact, even with the name, it was not allowed to put the messenger of Allah. They wanted Muhammad ibn Abdullah. They didn't want Rasulullah written on there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted this. SubhanAllah. He accepted this because he was wise and he could see the bigger picture. So part of the agreement was that there's going to be no Umrah this year for the Sahaba. Now I want you to imagine this. Anybody who's travelled between Mecca and Medina, you know how long distance this is. Now imagine walking it or travelling on a camel for probably, about, I did look up once how long it takes. I believe it's about five and a half days. To, to walk or travel at that pace from Mecca to Medina. And there's no aircon coaches or flights or anything like this. It was a hard, long journey. 
and they were so happy and they also heard about the dream of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave them, gave them so much hope because in their minds the dream was instant if that was this year that was going to happen this year so they weren't thinking maybe not this year so after the agreement is given the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks the Sahaba to remove their ihram and do the sacrifice and to do the halak, to, uh, to shave or shorten the hair. And they didn't get up. They just sat there. They didn't want to take the ihram off. They didn't want to give up on the idea of the umrah. The Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asks them several times to do this. And they disobeyed. And they wouldn't. Because they felt so strongly. If he'd have started getting angry and insisting and, you know, getting mad with them, what's going to happen? You're going to have a rebellion on your hands, right? He went in and spoke to his wife, Umm Salama, anha. And she was a very wise woman. And she said, go outside and do what you've asked them to do. Don't speak to them. Go outside and do your sacrifice and take yours and do your shaving of the head or shorting of the hair and see. He did this. And the Sahaba, عنهم, as soon as they saw him doing this, they were rushing to do the same. To the extent in some of the narrations it says that they were almost cutting each other's heads because they were so desperate to obey the Rasulullah Sometimes, brothers and sisters, actions speak louder than words. And showing people the beauty of the Sunnah is sometimes stronger than saying the Sunnah or telling people what to do. How many husbands nowadays will take advice from their wife or indeed from any woman, subhanAllah, but there was no cultural pride or arrogance in the heart of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And if brothers want to truly follow the sunnah, this is definitely the way to go. We can't always guarantee that the advice is going to be good though. We also see this reflected in the treatment of others. The Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam did hajj with his wives. And he was in a rush. And so he, he asked one of the Sahaba to make the camels go a bit quicker. And his wife Sophia's camel tripped and threw her off. Now out of the wives of the Rasulullah wasallam, Sophia was the most sensitive wife. And she started to cry. She fell off the camel. Bit of embarrassment, bit of pain. Yeah girls? It's embarrassing isn't it? SubhanAllah. Rasulullah got off his camel and came to her and he says, let it be, don't cry. And he wiped her tears with his hand, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, sisters, you will know, brothers, if you're married or, you know, with your mums maybe or, or daughters or whatever, you will know that sometimes when you say to a woman, are you okay? And you show some sympathy, it makes us ten times worse and we, te we cry ten times more. I don't know why that is, there's no logic behind it, it's just a thing. We, we do that. I know it's a bit weird. She did this. So she starts crying even more and she's absolutely beside herself by this time. I've fallen off my camel and I'm so totally devastated. SubhanAllah. Now we know that the Rasulullah was in a massive rush that day. He wanted to move things on. Do you know what he did? He stopped the entire caravan and set up camp from the, for the night, ordered everybody to get off their camels, set up camp for the night, just so that his wife could be recovered and to feel better, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, in other narrations, he's sending me letters now. Oh boy. Oh, there's please on this one, inshallah. <laughs> May Allah reward you, inshallah. About five minutes, takriban, inshallah. Can it be in Arabic five minutes? Nasa, no. no. <laughs> Okay. In fact, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he uh, was married to Sophia, and maybe with his other wives as well, but this particular narration mentions Sophia, radiallahu anha, he would kneel down beside his camel so that she could place her feet 
onto his knees and climb up the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam onto the camel. How many of you brothers open the car door for your wives every time she gets into the car? Leave that one with you, shall we? <laughs> yeah, okay, there's some, there's, some, there's some faces looking down, that's hilarious. But this is the equivalent, right? Opening the car door for the wife. It's just the, it's the, 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 the gesture of love and kindness and, and this, this beautiful treatment. So, we, we all have a legacy that we are going to leave. And our legacy as Muslims is building a legacy of following and emulating the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this, of course, will extend and affect everybody who your life touches. And we must make sure that our lives, all our lives, do justice to the legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that we're emulating him in the best of ways. And there are so many more stories and incidents that I can tell you about. But actually, to finish off, would you like to hear another story about Nu'ayman al-Ansari? Yes or yes? yes? Just one more story. Can I have one more story? One more story. One more story. One more story with him, because he's cool. In fact, after the death of the Rasulullah, he continued with his antics. One day, this is in the time of Uthman ibn Affan as the Khalif. Okay, so. One time the Sahaba عنهم, are in the masjid and there's a blind guy who comes into the masjid and he wants to urinate. We've talked about urination a lot today, haven't we, subhanAllah? So he wants to urinate, this blind guy, and the, the general practice was that he would, the, the, the blind guy or whoever wants, they're going to be taken outside of the masjid to do their thing outside. So Nu'ayman says, I'll deal with this, I'll take him, I'll sort this out. Instead of taking the blind guy outside, he takes him to a corner inside the masjid. When the people in the masjid see this guy urinating in the corner, they all race, rushing to go and stop him. They're angry, they they out, yeah? And this guy, of course, is terrified. He's, he's blind, he doesn't know, he's like, what's going on? As far as he's concerned, he's been taken outside. He doesn't realise what Noaman's done. Noaman, of course, runs off, runs away. So the blind guy, he's vexed, he's angry, he's irritated with what's happened. So he says, where is this guy? Who is this guy who, 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 who made me urinate in the corner of the mosque? I need, to, I need to deal with this guy. I need to deal with him harshly. The Sahaba, they know immediately who did this. They, there's only one Sahabi who's going to have done this. So they say, it must be no, it must be no Ayman. Bring me to him. Bring him to me. No Ayman, at this time, comes back. Okay, so he comes back to the blind guy. But instead of admitting that it's him who's done it, he puts on a different voice. So he disguises his voice and he says... Uh, are you looking for Naaman? The blind guy says, yeah, I need to deal with him. So he says, come, Echi, I'm going to take you to him. So he holds the hand of the blind guy and leads him across the masjid to who? To Uthman ibn Affan, the Amir al-Mu'minim. So this blind guy jumps on Uthman and starts beating him because he thinks that this is Nu'ayman who played this trick on him. And the Sahaba, of course, then pile in to protect Amir al mumini SubhanAllah. And actually, when it's all sorted out, Uthman is laughing, and guess what? Nu'ayman runs away again. Rabbi Allah anhum. Nu'ayman actually considered, uh, continued his laughter and pranks and tricks until the point at which the fitna began in the Ummah. And then he was so heartbroken by this, they say that he never smiled again, because he loved the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much. I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us to be true carriers of the sunnah and to open hearts through us. 
Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, abdika wa nabiyika wa rasulika wa nabiyya wa ala ahlihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika, ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atabu ilayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yasifun. Wa salamu ala al-Muslim. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa jazakum Allah khair. Wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.